And I have this talk to you today called Darwin Ate My App. And what I really want to talk about is adaptivity and adaptation, both in business terms and in the technology that enables that. And I'm sure you've all come across this quote from Mark Andreessen, Software is Eating the World. Great article. If you haven't read it, I recommend you, you read it. And basically what he's talking about is the way that the whole world is becoming digitized. Uh, just, you know, those people of you who took Uber is a prime example of this. You know, the, the, it's digitizing the experience of catching a taxi. Uh, the whole of England seems to have been taken over by Deliveroo and Just Eats, and, and you know, nobody goes out to a takeout anymore. They, they pull up something and food magically arrives at their door. So software is basically fundamentally changing the, work, the way we work. And, and my thesis today, what I'm trying to persuade you of, is that the only competitive companies in the future are those that are going to build adaptive digital experiences. So in other words, those companies that embrace this, that embrace digital transformation, but also become adaptive. Now you're going to say to me, Paul, what do you mean by adaptive? So I looked up the dictionary definition of adaptive, and frankly, it's pretty useless, isn't it? I mean, characterized by adaptation, and I'm like, okay, so what's adaptation? Adaptation, oh, I've gone too far, is the action or process of adapting to fit your environment. So what does that mean for a business? What it means for a business is that it evolves faster to market trends. So your environment is your, your market, your customers, and your engagement with those. So reacting more quickly to customer demands, uh, flexing and scaling the right way. So I have, and, and this doesn't necessarily mean digital. So we flex and scale our people in WSO2. So as you know, uh, the people who do support at WSO2 are our engineers, and our engineers go through rotation. They do support, they do marketing, they, they write code, they go out and see customers. So we flex based on our support. So if there's a lot of support calls coming in, we grab more people into the support department, and if the, there's fewer support calls, they don't just sit around twiddling their thumbs, they write a blog, they do some code, they produce a sample, they help the documentation team. So that's a, a purely human form of flexing and adaptation. But of course, a digital form is, is also there with cloud, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Creating new digital products faster is about adapting to your customers, it's about adapting to the market and seeing what works, and of course, What's, what Tyler was just talking about, coupling your costs uh, to your revenue, to your outcome. So flexing and adapting your costs to the, to the results is very important because one of the big reasons companies don't flex, don't adapt, is because they have fixed costs. And if you have fixed costs, you're like, well, I've got to sell that product. I've got to use that. I've, it's costing me a lot. I've got to make money out of that. If you're more flexible, if you're more adaptive to cost, then you can be more adaptive to, to your customers. So let's dig into this a bit further. So what does it mean? Well, adapting in real time is really what a lot of our customers are doing with some of our event processing and stream technology. And that's really where the events and streams come in. So for example, fraud detection or the ability to market dynamically the real-time decision-making, acting on data in real-time is one dimension of business adaptation. Another adaptation is adapting to workload challenges. So if one part of the business is doing really well, being able to scale that up quickly, being able to put the energy into that is a key aspect of being an adaptive business. And of course, adapting to business needs changing your offering, changing your business processes, changing the way you go to market, and evolution of those systems is the final way. So those are the three fundamental dimensions I want to talk about today of business adaptation. And when I was young, I was really into physics. I loved physics, and I hated biology. I ditched biology as soon as I could. 
And physics is really about simplifying the world. It's about trying to reduce things to their most basic laws, the most simple laws, the most simple particles, and understanding the world in terms of simplicity. Biology is the opposite. Biology is about understanding the world in terms of complexity. Biology is about how complex systems interact. And I've grown to kind of, let's not say love biology, but, but really appreciate it a lot more uh, as I've got older, because I've understood that the world is not simple, that simplistic and simpleness does not explain the complexity of our computing systems today. And I've really seen that. You know, I, I too had a, a computer in the 1980s. It was called a ZX80, my first computer. It had 1K of RAM, and it was simple, and it was, it was pure physics. You, know, you wrote some code, and it did what you wanted. Now, I look across the millions of lines of code. I think about deep learning. You know, all of these systems are, are complex, and managing complexity is our challenge. And the biological term of adaptation really means the process. And I think this is really important. It's the process of adapting. It's understanding how you build a process so you continue to adapt. Rather than just adapting once and saying, right, I'm done, adaptation is the ongoing process in biological terms. And it's pretty effective. Uh, here's an example of biological adaptation. Uh, this is some kind of caryatid, and it, it's beautiful, isn't it? And, and it's like, is, there, is that really an insect? Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and my, you know, what I'm saying to you is that this concept of biological adaptation happens in any system where you have iterations, generations, and you have some form of selection. Now, we are all involved in systems like this. So, do any of you do A, B, ah, let me just, let me just pause a second before I make that point. So, I'm not really talking about genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms are very cool. Genetic algorithms are where you embed this into the code. This aerial went into space, and it was designed by a genetic algorithm that basically tested out weird random changes and kept changing it until they got something that was the most effective. And this bizarre little set of twists turned out to be the most effective. So there's an example of complexity arising from a very simple process. Um, but this is not what I'm really talking about. What I'm really talking about is the meta-genetic algorithms that we're all involved in. The overall adaptation processes that we're involved in uh, throughout our business, throughout our companies, both in business and in technology. And if you do A-B testing, this is exactly what this is. So who does A-B testing on their marketing? Yeah, a few of you. If you don't do it, you are having it done to you. So Facebook, Google, Twitter, Trainline, Uber, uh, just eats every single web site you go to is putting out different versions of that website and seeing which gets better engagement, which gets better clicks, and therefore selecting the next generation of that website to go forward with, and then doing another A B test on the next action or iteration and seeing which of those works better and so forth. So we are all involved in biological adaptation of websites through A-B testing. And version control. You know, this is more in my world. Uh, you know, we have multiple versions of software. Those are the iterations. And we validate which, what's better about this version compared to the previous version. And if it's not better, we revert. If it doesn't build, we kill it and, and redo it. So this is a form of adaptation where we hopefully get better software through and through. Now, of course, the question we have to ask is how to speed that up and how to improve it. Now, there are two forms of adaptation in biology. I, I didn't realize this until recently. 
What we talk about in, in generally is what's called vertical gene transfer. You know, I inherited some genes from my mother and father. That's what you call vertical gene transfer. But there is actually horizontal gene transfer. So the reason antibiotics are failing all around the world, one of the reasons why is that cells are actually transmitting antibiotic-resistant genetics between each other. This is known as horizontal gene transfer. And in code terms, in, in my world, I see the vertical gene transfer as being from one generation of code to the next, from WSO2 ESB 4.8 to WSO2 ESB 4.9. But horizontal gene transfer, well, what is that? That's open source. That's what open source is. Open source is we get code from third parties and we embed it into our products. Other people take our projects and embed them into their products. You guys take our code and build platforms and solutions with it, and that is horizontal gene transfer. And these two things are really powerful. Uh, there's actually an academic paper written on this which studies evolution in open source terms. Um, I recommend you read it, it's quite interesting by some Japanese. They're looking at some particular Linux projects and, and finding uh, evolutionary patterns in those. So now let's talk about the speed of evolution. So what drives the speed of evolution? So if you've be believed me that it's all about having iterations and selection, then the speed is obvious. The speed is about the rate of creation of new generations and the time for selection to kick in. So this is why everyone, WSO2 included, is driving down our continuous integration and continuous delivery cycles. This is why we're all moving to faster cycles. If you only deliver software every six months, and then it takes you a few months to see if, it was, if it's working in the marketplace, you have a very long speed of iteration and a long selection process. If you update the cloud every week or every two weeks and you quickly get customer feedback, then you instantly know what's working and what isn't and you adapt much quicker. And this is what biologists do. Biologists use fruit flies to study genetics. Why do they use fruit flies? These things breed instantly. There are new fruit flies every day, and they die quickly. <laughs> they quickly find out, is this mutation, what has happened to it, what's, what's going on? So this is, a, this is their equivalent of CICD pipelines. So let's talk about technology, right? So I've been talking about biology and business, and I'm meant to be the chief technology officer. So let's finally get on to some technology. And the reality is that those same concepts of business adaptivity apply to the technology. So we want to act in real time. We want to analyze events, streaming data, patterns and behavior in real time and adapt the way we respond to those. We want to scale as needed. And this is the huge move to the cloud and why we've been at the forefront of cloud native software for seven years is because we wanted to build systems that could scale, but not just scale, but scale independently. You could scale different parts of the WSO2 platform uh, separately so as to scale what's needed. And, and this is what we've been doing for many years and helping customers do. And of course, we want to move to faster iteration, but also we want to move to better observability. So we want to understand what works and what doesn't work. We want to see through analytics, through data, um, through observability, what happens when you change the system and what your customers are doing and how you can adapt to better fit them. And continuous integration is a great example of this iterational generation. You know, just forget about continuous delivery. 
if the code doesn't build, it gets booted back. So all over our offices in, 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 in our development labs, we have big screens up showing each product and whether their daily build worked or not. So we're not just having observability, we're, we're pushing it into the development team's faces. And, and if I see you know, the ballerina team's build didn't run yesterday, I'm like, hey, Samira, what's happening there? You know, so that's, that's a little bit of evolutionary pressure on Samira to, to make sure his build works. And let's see if we can get this to build to the next screen. So who's come across Chaos Monkey? It's about the third of you. So Chaos Monkey, oh, now we're going, now we're going everywhere. So Chaos Monkey is a system developed by Netflix. And it's basically a bit of code that automatically kills production servers in their AWS system. So they basically, they have their production system in, in Amazon, and they have a second process that goes around randomly bringing down production servers. Now, I often think of this as a psychological thing. This is basically forcing the developers to think, well, I better make sure my code is resilient because I know it's going to get killed. But actually, I started thinking of this in terms of evolution and adaptation. What is this doing? This is increasing the selection pressure. This is the computing equivalent of a cold winter. And, and you know, when you see those beautiful documentaries in the north and, and there are all those elk going across the, the thing and, and the presenter says, and, and this year is a cold winter and not many elk are going to survive. You know, it's, it's about ensuring only the fittest survive. So this is really what chaos engineering is about. It's enhancing the selection. It's making a harder environment for ourselves. I sometimes feel this is what WSO2 is doing with, our, with open source. Our licenses don't force you to, to love us and keep us. We are basically forcing ourselves to be better selected by using a license which, which is less lock-in than our competitors. And so we have to strive harder to make sure you like us, because otherwise you're like, well, you know, if, if that support's not worth anything to me, I have no lock-in to this software. So Tyler talked about abstractions and complexity. And I think this is absolutely key to this concept of adaptation and adaptability. Because it's all very well saying, I can build a new digital product, a new digital experience, and I can maybe do it in a month, get it out there. But unless I can maintain and evolve that software, I'm stuck. So I wrote my, uh, the code for my PhD thesis in Node.js. And this is a great example. It's all in open source. You can go look at it. And I was very quick at producing something that worked. But it is completely unmaintainable. That's partly Node.js and it's partly my coding. And it's partly because I didn't use the right Node.js abstractions. So they've added all sorts of useful code to help you deal with the asynchronous nature of Node.js. And I didn't use those. I was in the pure JavaScript. I didn't have the right abstractions. And now I look at that code and I'm like, what was I doing? I have no idea. If you ask me to add a new feature to that code base, it's going to take me two months to relearn it and five minutes to change the feature, right? But I can't, we can't afford that two months. So abstractions and complexity are absolutely, uh, abstractions to, to deal with complexity are absolutely essential uh, to maintain this adaptation and adaptability. And this is where I think this concept of APIs, events, and streams is really important. Because if you take the whole of your IT assets, the whole of your IT landscape, and you turn it into APIs, you turn your identities into APIs, you turn your policies into APIs, you turn your data into APIs, you turn your legacy systems into APIs, you build streams and events 
out of the actions that are happening, out of the, you know, every time you sell something, there's an event that somebody can then just say, right, I'm going to trigger on that event, or I'm going to analyze that stream of data. Then it gives you a much simpler, cleaner view of the world. Now, one of the things here that's really important about this message is it's both push and pull. You need both of these. You can't just see the world in terms of, I'm going to talk to an API. You need this world in which events and streams are also providing reaction to the environment. You can't adapt to the environment unless you have both push and pull. So APIs, events, and streams give you this very rich world. They, they basically give you access to anything that can be queried or activated. They give you access to trigger off any event. And they give you the ability to do pattern matching and analysis across what's happening out there in the world. They let you analyze and, and capture the behavior of the world around you and adapt to it. And we have loads of examples of companies doing this. So StubHub was one of our first API customers. And they don't just use APIs to third parties. Every single part of their business is mapped as an API. They have an API-first strategy so that when you build a system inside StubHub, you automatically go to the set of APIs and start using that, and you automatically create a new API with it. Transport for London is using events and streams to improve the experience. So this is the plan for today of what roadworks are happening around us. And this is now available and is being used by every single utility company, all the traffic management systems in London to help speed up traffic around, around, the Lon around London. And there are other, other parts of the country are now talking about taking on this technology and taking on this kind of management. And they use events to notify the right people to make sure that this is dealt with. Uber got up at our last conference and talked about handling 30 billion messages a day uh, through our event processing and stream processing to find fraud detection to do dynamic marketing. Now, they have this product. Who's heard of Grayball? So Grayball is not very popular. They started this out as a way of uh, fighting their competitors. They basically actively identified Lyft employees. And when the Lyft employee tried to hire an Uber, there would be no cars magically in the area. And then they realized that maybe this would be useful against the taxi regulatory organizations too. Maybe they weren't quite following the regulatory environment in a particular city, and they could actually adapt the view by identifying the people who worked for the government and not offering them a taxi when they pulled up the Uber app. So this is a highly adapted and adaptive uh, program uh, there is some very small print saying this is not legal and I'm not recommending you do this. Uh, but I thought it was an interesting example. I don't know whether they built this with any WSO2 technology or not. And if they did, I'm taking no responsibility for it when they end up in court. Jaguar Land Rover is also building an adaptive business and they're actually building it in the manufacturing plant. They have what they call industrial middleware. They've taken WSO2, ESB, and API manager and put it into the factory. And that is a, a, a major area for businesses in manufacturing to really improve the adaptivity. I mean, you know, these guys are fighting against Tesla. And Tesla has shown that it's a highly adaptive business and it can pull products to market more quickly. And so this new electric Jaguar is aiming to get to market faster using WSO2 technology. So abstractions manage complexity, but you guys know that I can't stand up here and say, just use APIs, events, and streams, and your life will be simple. You know, the world doesn't work that way, right? So we, we can 
abstract from complexity, but we can't remove complexity. And anything that tries to do that is not going to work. There's a famous saying from somebody I read recently, which is, for every really difficult problem, there's a simple answer that is 100% wrong. Right? And we don't want to provide the, the simple answer to the complex problem that's wrong. And that's why we need governance. Governance is about managing the complexity underneath those abstractions. And this is really, you know, I've taken some time out of WSO2, and I, I, governance is a word I hate. I've always hated governance, because you read about governance, and it's all about committee meetings, and I hate committee meetings. So I don't really like governance, but I've realized that actually we're doing a different kind of governance at WSO2. And it's really about the intersection of people and technology, and what we're doing with governance at WSO2 are very concrete, real things like a store and a registry, which help both keep the configuration and give people a human view of it. Identity management, keeping track of people and systems and making sure that they are doing the right thing. Runtime policy control through gateways where we're actually enforcing this at runtime. And most of all, observability and monitoring giving you the visibility into the system so that you have that control. And when you take those APIs, events, and streams, and you multiply them by that governance, then you start to get an answer that gives you the abstraction, but doesn't hide the complexity. It manages the complexity. And I think this is really important. There's one more point I want to make. I love Escher, who drew this. And, and this is when you th say the word recursion to me, this is what I think of. I still remember the first time I had a programming language in which I could write recursive code and how excited I was. And we're building a recursive architecture here. And we have been from the start. From day one, WSO2 has said everything's a service. And when you compose a service or you use a service, you create another service. We've always had that in mind. Um, and every time you create an API, an event, or a stream, we want you, every time you consume one, we want you to create one. And you know, in Ballerina, that's a one-step process. When you consume APIs in Ballerina, you create an API that automatically has a Swagger definition. In CIDI, in our event processing system, when you consume an event or a stream, you automatically create a new event or a stream. Now, in our other products, you know, if you take a services SOA view of the world, that's true as well. When you consume a service, you create a service. But when you consume a service, you, it's a two-step process at the moment to create an API. You build the service in the ESB, and then you pop it into the API manager. We want everything to be a one-step process. And that's one of the things that we're working on, is making sure that every time you create an event, a stream, or an API inside any of our tools, they're automatically governed and exposed as events, APIs, and streams. Now, we're really close to that. I'm not trying to do down what we've done today, but it is an area where we can improve, and, and what Ballerina and City have shown us is that can, be all, that can be just completely automatic. Talking of Ballerina, you know, Tyler mentioned this. We see this as really key to adaptivity. And the reason why is because it's the right programming model to give you a simple and maintainable, updatable, adaptable view of orchestration and of how you create services in a microservices architecture. That's really what we're aiming for here. And we're aiming to give you faster speed, not just to create stuff, but also to maintain it by building the right abstractions over orchestration and choreography. And it's really about what is an adaptive app. An adaptive app is something that creates and consumes APIs, events, and streams. It scales up and down quickly. So that means super fast boot time. It means low memory. So you can run these things in serverless or Docker. And 
reincarnation is welcome in the ballerina world and in an adaptive app. What does that mean? That means that if this dies, a new instance can be brought up quickly. In fact, at the moment, we think we can bring up a new instance of Ballerina faster than we can garbage collect. So it may be better to bring up a new instance than garbage collect the old one, because we're f the, the environment is faster than the JVM at doing that. So why not? So reincarnation is welcome. And really, my main point here is that the time to adapt is really, is really short that we, we have the right programming model, the right environment, and therefore you can adapt quicker, you can move faster. And of course, without observability, without that by default, we, we can't see, is this better than the last version or not? So by the way, just if you're following Ballerina, uh, we launched a new technology preview. It went live yesterday. It's up on the website. It has a whole bunch of new features. There's also some really cool features from point 0.94 that you may not have come across, better data mapping, uh, improved semantics for multi-threading and workers, uh, functions on types, and there's a whole track on Ballerina, if you're into, that you can either grab or you can dip in and out of. Lots of good sessions on that this week. I finally want to talk a little bit about observability. Uh, and this guy is a bit of a hero in control theory. His name's Rudolf, Professor Rudolf Kalman. Anyone heard of a Kalman filter? So if you've seen a quadcopter floating there, that's because of this guy, because they only work because of Kalman filters. And Kalman filters are basically about observing the position and reacting to it and adapting to it. And he, he defined the whole science of observability. And I'm using the word observability very specifically rather than monitoring or analytics. Observability, in my mind, means three things. It means seeing the testing. So in other words, the intersection of the test, the low-level monitoring of your applications and processes, but also the business outcomes. Because this is what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about adaptive business, and if you don't, your, your new iteration doesn't sell more widgets than the old iteration, it's not helping you. If your website doesn't get more clicks through to the Buy It Now page, it's not helping you. So you need a strategy to observe the whole stack from failures, from the running code, through to the actual business. And really, this is, uh, you know, this is what our platform is about. We take your existing systems, we integrate them, we expose your data, we take your identities, we take IoT systems, and we produce APIs, events, and streams, and we monitor, we govern, and we analyze those. And that helps you connect across these different uh, users, employees, developers, partners, operators, and it enables this next generation of adaptive applications that are coming. And by the way, every WSO2 product has APIs into the function. This is the way we've built our product since about 2006. Uh, when, we, when we came up with the Carbon Framework and every single function we build always has an API. In fact, I think we built them from, from day one that way. That was just improved in Carbon. And every single product creates events and streams that you can act on through our analytics and stream processing technology. And this is a nice example of a company that is adapted to use this. So BNY Mellon took they wanted to create a complete API platform that unified every single part of their business out to their customers. And they already had a front end they wanted to use. So rather than use our API manager storefront, they embedded that technology into their existing platform, but used the underlying power of our storefront technology 
in their, in their own portal. So that's a real example of how APIs create a platform that can take on horizontal gene transfer and code from outside and embed it. So their platform includes our platform. Everything that's in our platform becomes part of this Nexen platform that they're sharing. Our WSO2 update manager, has anyone used this yet? So this is our new way of shipping releases to you, and it's built on APIs. But what is it doing? Fundamentally, this is driving better biological adaptation in us and in your systems. Why is that? It's letting us reduce our cycle to get code to you. It's letting us ship new features faster to our customers, building that adaptation and speeding it up through APIs. So I think this is a really nice example of what we're doing here. So, uh, you know, Tyler said this, I think, you know, our claim is that we're the only company that is really doing this. APIs, streams and events, observable, governed, manageable, scalable, cloud native and open source. And I, I think that's a really powerful story. So where are we going in the future? Well, obviously we're looking at how our systems work in serverless and cloud native environments. We have many, many customers deploying us in Docker, in Kubernetes. We're running our own code in our cloud in Kubernetes and cloud native systems, in Mesos, in Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're working on the recursive nature of our technology which is about speeding generational adaptation. We're building a better programming model with Ballerina, uh, with Cidi, and with some other things around APIs, events, and streams. And we're trying to, we have a concept of governance by surveillance, which is about saying governance doesn't have to be top down, it can be bottom up. And we can actually improve the governance and manage complexity better by analyzing everything that's happening and bringing sense to it, rather than enforcing top-down uh, governance models, which frankly have been really hard to work. So, of course, we have a, a set of amazing sessions and tracks here. And I'm not really here to give you the technology. I'm here just to hopefully tweak your interest and make you think about maybe hitting the integration track or the API track, finding more about our APIs and streams. Maybe you're here to hear about banking and PSD2 compliance and how APIs are going to revolutionize the banking world. Maybe you want to know more about recursive cloud-native programming with Ballerina. Or maybe you want to think about your identities and access management from an API event and stream point of view in our IAM track. So finally, here's my call to action. You know, are you building an adaptive enterprise? Do you have iteration and observability? Do you have uh, fast selection? Are you converting your IT assets into API streams and events? Do you have a recursive architecture? And are you adapting to real-time data? And I know a lot of you are, and I've been away for two and a half years, and I'd love to hear those stories. And so if you have a story, come and find me, because I'm really interested to hear your customer examples to add to my list here. And if you think there's an area where you can improve, this is a great time to take three days out and think about that. And hopefully think about it maybe in a slightly different way with a bit of, um, a bit of genetic inspiration, a bit of Darwinianism. So, you know, what have I said? Biological adaptation is driving our business and software. The right architecture allows us to adapt faster. Observability and, and governance help manage those abstractions and make it work. And creating and adapting digital exper experiences is the key to becoming an adaptive business. And while I was researching this, I found this weird thing, this web page. Basically said, Charles Darwin ate all of those animals that he was studying. You know, you read about him studying finches in the Galapagos Island. 
he was eating roast finch. He was having iguanas and armadillos and everything. And so I kind of felt that this was a, an update to Mark Andreessen's saying, you know, software is eating the world, but Darwin is eating software. Thank you very much. <laughs>